Good afternoon, everybody. We are now on here live on Facebook for this week's PDOCS live stream. And as you guys might know, right, every other week I have a guest expert speaker and the weeks in between I'm having on team members going over what we uh, are working on now and really lessons that you guys have asked for in previous polls or what I get demand on based on content and posts. Um, so this is all about, you know, how we fill our calendars organically. So whether you're watching here on this Zoom call with me in our Facebook group live or perhaps on my YouTube platform, um, there will be everything down below in the description in terms of resources and some of the um, content and um, tools and frameworks that I'm going to go over and share with you guys today. Um, I'll make sure you get access to those down in the comments or the description. On Facebook, actually, if you're watching the live stream there, just comment below because I'm going to go through a few resources on what you might want me to send over if any of this is helpful. Um, YouTube, I'll have it all in the description down below of the video here. Um, if you found the content somewhere else, you're pretty damn sneaky because I only post it in my Facebook group and on YouTube. So um, again, the whole objective and today's lesson is filling our calendars organically. Have we've done that time and time again? You guys may have saw some of my posts kind of talking about this topic this week um, and how we've done this on rinse and repeat. And a lot of you guys that have followed us for a while or been in this group for a while, you've seen it all. Um, but I just want to let you know, you know, that organic isn't dead. It still works. It's still effective. And it's all about the approach and, and if the approach is effective, right? And that's what I want to get into today. So first off, let me just share my screen and dive into a couple of resources here. Bear with me a second. So we'll, we'll just start with this one. One second. There we go. Screen. So I have a few different things I brought up. This is more of kind of a mini value course that I put together for certain clients and students and happy to share with you guys. Um, but this isn't a lot I'm going over on the call. I'm just showing you this is here and happy to send it to you guys or in YouTube. Look for the title that says uh, Outreach and Messenger Mastery, and that will be where this resource is. Um, but I have a great interview I did with another um, organic outreach expert on his um podcast or live stream in front of his community. And that was really, really valuable. I have a messenger mastery masterclass all about how to operate in messenger. We're going to cover that briefly, but if you want more training specifically to mastering the art of messenger um, and DM conversations, there's that. Our PDOCS appointment setting SOP, which in the past, a lot of you guys may have paid for or got in with some of our paid courses um, I'm offering for free here. And my offer building masterclass, which if you're looking to craft a high ticket core offer, say between two and 10K, this would probably be really, really valuable for you. Um, so we have that available. Now, in terms of like the outreach strategy and blueprint, I've gone through this on another pro on, on another training. I just want to go through this quick before we dive into today's topic. Now, as I talked about a little already, today's topic is kind of spin off of a training I shot two weeks ago. So if you didn't see that and you want that, just let me know. Um, we're really doing the tail end. So the, the prior training was more about the components and the aspects to first launching your outreach campaign, how I should set up my profile, how I get engagement, what type of groups to be joining. And we'll cover a little bit of that because that ties right into this. But this is more about once we've got to that engagement phase. Now the other three aspects are number one after that, it'd be number two, right? Number one's engagement. Engagement. Number two, transitional messaging. And that's where within the comments, within the engagement, that's where we draw intrigue, provide value, and move that, that conversation off of the comment thread and over to a DM convo. Um, so that's step three is the DM. How do I properly pre-qualify, set the agenda, um, and go through that conversation where I'm not interviewing or spammy. I'm actually coming from a place of service and able to solve a problem. And how do I get that to come off right so I'm not getting ghosted and I'm getting replies? And then step four, the call to action. When do I go in for the booking or send my VSL or the, you know, whatever the next step is within my funnel? Predominantly, what we're going to talk about here is how to book people right from this. Um, but you may just have a landing page, a checkout page, whatever your flow is, right? Um, so when you're first doing organic outreach, a couple of things to consider if you haven't already done this. I'd like to think this is common sense for a lot of people, but um, we all know not everybody has been in this space as long or or <laughs> common sense isn't so common nowadays. I mean, that's another aspect, right? So whole different discussion. But number one, you should prime your profile to reflect the offer and the expert or the industry or the niche that you're in. I like to say that's usually um, four primary characteristics. You should have a cover photo that reflects your offer. You should have a profile picture that's kind of professional, but yet 
still you. So whether that's you and a child, you and a spouse, something relatable, right? Um, I don't think you need to go too, you know, business or professional like depending on your industry. I think that's more for your LinkedIn profile. I think Facebook is more of a casual type of platform where you're having different conversations than maybe a business first type of platform like LinkedIn, right? So um, then you should have a tagline or a bio that 101 characters, I believe it is on Facebook, that is intriguing. And like I like to say, to keep this really simple and short, is as short as sweet as you can say what you do and who you help and then kind of make an inside joke that only your market would understand. For instance, one of my taglines that worked really well is I help people level up their businesses organically without needing a Russell Brunson like ad budget, right? That was a really good one that worked for me. It tells I help service-based businesses. Um, my expertise is organic. And then I make a little inside joke that only my market would really understand. And that helps you stand out a little bit rather than the typical thing that most coaches teach with a profile is I help X do Y in X amount of time without giant obstacle or hurdle, right? So I help agencies um, book more qualified leads without having to spend more on ads, um, you know, whatever, you know, <laughs> you, you can you can go with whatever you want. But the way I look at it now is like, hey, I help X do Y without jumping through flaming ho hoops and you don't have to give up your firstborn child, right? I mean, that's being a little more sarcastic, but that's basically what they boil down to. And and there's too many that are the same. So I don't want to spend too, too much time on this. I want to get into the curriculum, but number one, uh, prime your profile. Number two, identify and target your ideal audience um, and who you want to be connecting. Then add the right people. Don't just grow your profile and your social media with followers or people. Grow them with the right people that are actually going to engage with your content that are actually going to, um, you know, engage that are going to request your trainings, your links, your info, your offers that are actually interested and are in the same industry, suffer from the same problem that you help with, right? All those type of things. Um, the content objective is whenever we're creating content, we have to have a very specific objective. And I'm going to dive into that a little more. Um, utilize some of the group strategies, which we're talking about a bit here today. And that ties back to that first training I mentioned I shot about two weeks ago. Um, have a dialed in outreach approach for both cold and warm. It's a little bit different. Um, I discussed that when I went over this transitional messaging, um, optimize your sales process after the booking. And we're not going to get too much into that today and close deals and get paid, right? So the other thing I want to cover is some of the content strategies. And we just talked about this, right? So here's a tutorial within the sheet. If you want the one that's organic content strategies, just let me know in the comments, right? But here's a main tutorial just specific to this and going over this document and going more in depth about knowing the difference between warm and cold, understanding the sophistication level of your audience, what type of poster content, long form, short form, video content, value-based content, story-based content, when should I use it? Why? We get into all that, the different type of lead types how you should constantly be optimizing and getting the feedback loop. If you know a certain topic or post isn't engaging, don't keep posting about that. Change it up, right? All those little things. Um, and then content creation ideas, right? So there's simple, short form, question-based. There's long form, story-based. There's video, there's value-based, there's result-based. Um, there's new updates. There's, you know, research-based. Um, you can utilize your offer pillars if you have that built out. Those are usually core areas that are great for creating content because anytime somebody engages, with that topic of discussion, it directly correlates to your offer and it's a smooth transition into that conversation. And then also repurposing and evolving your content as I talk about, we all get those memories. You posted this one year ago, two years ago. I find it funny, number one, how I look at that content as I've evolved as a business owner and I either, I'm like, oh, that's spot on. I, I, I don't change a thing and I'll reshare it, right? Or I'm like, hey, I've evolved on my thought on that. I don't actually feel the same way or I have a new approach. So I'll use that same content that may have engaged a year ago and I'll tweak it and update it with new thoughts, new approaches, how I now feel about that or something I may now know that I didn't know a year ago, right? Um, and don't overthink it. When it gets into organic, it's all about the actual activity. As much as everybody says all the trips, ticks, tips, tricks, and tactics for organic, if you're not actually doing the work and every day you're out there posting, out there, you know, implementing these strategies and doing it consistently and holding yourself accountable, um, you know, you're never going to get anywhere. So that ties into those first three right there fail forward, do it and do it often, constant activity, hold yourself accountable. When you look in the mirror at the end of the day, if your goal at the beginning of the day was to publish three posts, send out um, 15 no new DMs and 10 friend requests, and at the end of the day, you've only done two posts, four and six, your day's not done. Look at yourself in the mirror and say, shoot, I got to get back on my phone or back to my computer and finish my organic stuff, you know, my metrics. Um, constant tweaking, optimization, more publishing and posting and less thinking. So, um, and then there's an additional correlating tutorial 
um, that talks all about that as well. So that's a good example of that. Now let's kind of dive into the main objective here today and what we want to go into. So we talked about, you know, first off, the four main aspects of things. And again, you guys can look at this kind of in the ACES framework I've talked about before. It's all about attention, conversation, educating, and then getting to the sale. And this four-step thing, number one, engagement is the attention. Number two, the transitional messaging is the beginning of the conversation. Number three, isn't as much an education in this process as it's more a continuation of the conversation. And it's more of a triage or pre-qualifying phase. We'll get into how that looks. And then number four here is the call to action or the booking which in that case would lead to number four and the other process of ACEs with the sale, right? We can't do that without a booked call and somebody on our calendar. Um, so let's go through, through, through some different strategies there first and foremost. What I'm gonna do first off, we'll do a little on the engagement. Again, I already did a few different, um, I already did a few different lessons on this in the past. And basically um, today we're gonna focus on the latter three but let's dive into the engagement a little bit aspect and let me share my screen and just bring up a couple of posts um, that have worked pretty well for us internally or things I've seen work well for other people in the industry. One moment here. I had too many people hop in a second and I mute, minimize my screen. There we go. Now I'm back. Cool. So a couple examples of simple things you can do for engagement is anytime you create something of value, you know, repurposing that or offering that in a, you know, value based sense. Um, so a post like this, like this was an RP docs group by an old team member, Yash, good friend, and he's doing great things. Right. And the post was very simple. Messaging master class replay is ready. Um, we went over how we've booked 3,000 plus appointments just through DMs in the last year. Who wants it, right? 151 comments. Now, this is more in a place where you control the traffic, right, in your group or your own timeline. It's more difficult to do these posts in other people's groups. And that goes back to knowing, you know, the objective, um, you know, what you're on here to do. And, and that will help us craft the type of post we're trying to do. So let's look at another example of uh, this one here. Um, this was online coaches and consultants, just a post I came across. I don't even know this woman, but I do remember in the transitional messaging, um, doing some comments on this, but that's very engaging, right? 386 comments and very simple. Hey, we've generated 249 leads in the last nine days and I'm sharing it all for free. Want access before I make it paid, right? That builds urgency, that builds authority, that shows a very direct result, 249 leads in a very specific time frame. So they did a lot of very... Um, kind of thought out things and objectives in creating this quick little two sentence post. So you, again, that's what I talked about earlier, like overthinking this is not something you need to do. Um, it's just got to value, it's got to you know offer value, it's got to engage, it's got to solve a problem. And another thing I like to say to people when they're thinking about like, what type of content do I create? Well, what do you go comment on? What do you like? What do you engage with? A lot of times those same type of posts, you should be creating similar things. I'm not saying go copy and paste that post, but I'm saying if you're commenting on posts like this, you should probably be creating posts like this and so on and so forth. Sometimes we even overthink that. It's like the type of content that engages you will likely also engage your ideal audience, especially if you simplify it a little more. If we're an export an expert and our idea audience is a novice or a beginner, um, our expertise needs to be kind of broken down to their level. I don't want to use the phrase dumbed down, but I mean, in essence, it's dumbed down, right? So um, this was Dr. Connor, a very smart guy. What he's doing now in the Airbnb space has been great. Um, excellent email marketer as well. We've worked with Connor on a few different things, but again, um, another way to grow his group, he's doing giveaways, right? 3,000 member giveaway, one slot in our implement and release program, 100% free, drop a one. So obviously that's going to get a lot of engagement, but that's something you can think about if you're growing a community. Hey, when I get to 500 members, I should do a giveaway of 50% off into my program or one free slot. And with the understanding that that guy is going to give you a testimonial as soon as he lands his first client, it's a win, win, win. It shows your group that you're delivering value. Whoever wins the giveaway is going to go scream from the rooftops about you and your program. And then you're probably going to get a great testimonial out of it. So there's a lot of ways we can utilize different things. Um, to you know, expand our network and get more content, testimonials, case studies, all that stuff that people talk about with social proof. I still tend to think they're a little overrated, but I fully understand people's lack of confidence without having good testimonials to take to market. Like I get it. You can certainly sell without them and it's easier to have um, authority, you know, credibility. Um, this was another very simple one, right? It's official. I'm writing my first ebook to show coaches how they hit their first 5K months without ads. Even if you're brand new, who wants a copy when it's ready? So he's basically pre, you know, 
pre-taking this information to pre-presenting this information to his audience. He saw he got 38 people that were interested. So he's probably like, cool. He probably had something, when I write something like this, it's for research. Hey, if I do this post and a minimum of 25 people comment, I'll go actually do it, right? If I create a post and two people raise their hand, I'm not going to go write a book that two people want unless I have other, you know, aspirations for it or objectives for it. But that's likely what this post is doing. It's it's going to your audience saying, hey, I have this idea. If I did this, is there value there? And when enough people say yes, then I go create it. Um, another mistake a lot of us make as entrepreneurs is we like to go make what we think the audience wants, and then we take it to market, and we get crickets, and no one's interested. So this approach is a lot better in the sense that we ask first, um, and then you know later go in and, and create the content or um, the resource or whatever it is that we're talking about. So there's a few good examples of just engaging posts that I just had saved um, you know, from recent recent trainings and stuff that I've shown. So that's the first aspect is getting engagement. Now, the transitional messaging is where stuff gets kind of interesting. So when somebody engages, and again, that's why I talked about earlier in the beginning, go through those other resources I mentioned and understand the objective of your post. You know, I always like to say, create your post with a purpose to elicit a response of substance. So unless it's a flat giveaway saying, raise your hand or say yes, and you have a call to action, it's a smooth segue, a two-step post, a very direct offer-based post. Other than that, you wanna have a question you know, hey, curious if, you know, implementing higher close percentages and show up rates into your business would change your overall profitability here in the next few months. And what would that do for your business, right? Something that's going to say, yeah, if I had better show up rates and better close percentage, I could see our revenues 2xing, which would significantly, you know, um, um, alter how I can grow and, and you know, have more comfortability in growing the business, right? Something that, that you know you're going to get a response of a little bit of substance rather than just one or two words. And then when they give you that information, I always like to kind of use the, our AAA framework that we do. No matter what I get back, I kind of want to agree with them, acknowledge either what they said or maybe a misconception with what they said, and then ask a question deeper. So, you know, if our first post is, you know, something along the lines of, um, the, the example I just gave is actually fine, right? So, you know, if you had improved leads or show up rates and close percentages, what would that do for your business? And somebody comes back and says what that guy just said, I'd come back saying, hey, my friend, I totally agree. Um, you know, when you increase sales metrics, it is a good chance that that revenues could, could double. Just curious, when you said that would help you grow your business a little more comfortably, what does that look like to you? Is that hiring more team members? Is that, you know, delegating more tasks? What does that look like? So now the guy's going to come back and tell me a little about what that looks like. And from there, I can really give some educated insight, right? He might come back saying, yeah, I'd like to hire two more team members and go part-time and, and just oversee the business rather than be in it. Totally, Mr. Business Owner. That's a that's a fantastic goal to have. Hey, just curious, um, in the two team members you're looking to hire, what do you think you need to outsource and delegate first and why? And does any of that have to do with your sales team, right? And you could just dive in and get a little deeper. And then after about two or three responses and transitional messages is where I like to take it off of the thread, right? And then into the DMs. And I'll usually do it by this. Hey, man, rather than just keep going back and forth here in this thread, would it be cool if I just shot you a DM and sent you over some more insight and resources based on um, our discussion and how I think I might be able to show you some value, right? And the guy's going to be like, sure, man, shoot me a DM. Then you have permission. It's not spammy. Shoot him a friend request first. He accepts. Jump in the DMs. And then that's a simple transition, right? That's what I mean, warm DMs to cold DMs. Warm DM is somebody that's already, you have a reason to be there talking to them. They either said DM me. They commented on some of your stuff. They're wow. expecting it as opposed to a cold one would be different. So this is a very easy transition. Um, hey, Mr. Prospect, we were just talking in the XYZ Facebook community. You said you wouldn't <laughs> mind if I DM you. Hey, based off what you were talking about, I'd love you to check out this training about our micro commitment process. This is how we build sales teams, sales processes to highly increase show up and close percentages. Watch the quick little seven minute video and let me know your takeaways. Boom. So then the guy's going to be, oh, right. Thank you for the video. I'm going to go check it out and get back to you. Now I've done a few things, right? I've already kind of built up a little credibility. I've recommended solutions. I'm coming from a place of service. I haven't asked to pitch him nothing. And now I'm educating him more. That resource when you have the right conversation and you're sending the right resource, that should kind of blow the prospect away. And they're going to come back saying, damn, right, I'm not doing half of the things in your current sales process. I could totally see how that could change things. And can we have a conversation about how this could work for me? Sure. Boom, boom, boom. Right. So that would be a really easy one. If that's if everything's running smooth and you can just transition easily. That's when a prospect has what's called strong acceptance to your frame. Whatever you're kind of putting out there, they're saying, hey, man, this is awesome. Totally agree. If you have a little weaker frame or their skepticism, again, 
that's why a resource is great build value let them go watch it and then come back to it right and if they had it you know skepticism or apprehension after they've watched it hey man what did you think about that do you see how that might be able to help you solve your problem well yeah ray i do but i'm not sure about how that would work in my business and how much that costs oh well i wasn't trying to pitch you or sell you anything but i'd be happy to hop on a brief little 15 minute call and walk you through exactly how this could look in your business i've set this up in dozens and dozens of high ticket remote businesses and i've seen you know great success every goddamn time so worth 15 minutes of your time yeah. sure yeah I'd love to hop on and jump on right so and then that's how i get into the the full triage call um sometimes that will turn right into a sales call or sometimes you're just kind of feeling them out to understand how much they've bought into the certainty and the efficacy of your solution, your program, whatever you're discussing in that topic, right? So those are some good examples of that. What I'm going to do real quick, give me one more second. I'm going to screen share and I'm going to bring up a couple posts where I did this recently. Um, I did one last week on one of Adam's posts. So I'll, I'll cover this in a moment, my kind of sniper versus shotgun approach. I'm glad I got through this pretty quickly. Um, a, I talk fast. B, I have no guests on, so I can cover a lot. But um, I'll get to go into a little of my sniper versus shotgun approach, how you can go very streamlined with your outreach approach as opposed to wide and how I can use other people's content. So there's days I want to go do organic and book leads, but I don't feel like creating posts. And I have a, a, a great method for that. And I do it quite often. So I'll show you a quick little example. Let me go bring that up just because I think I I lowered that screen so I could uh, eliminate the background noise. Give me one second. Fun that. Hopefully everybody is having a great day. And hopefully you're getting a little value or learning some here. Okay, so I'll bring up that first and then I'll go to the other one. Well, we're here for client acquisition, so. This is this is a good organic approach. I'm giving a lot of overviews, but we'll go, we'll go into some more depth stuff here in a minute. Cool, so let me just scroll down and find the post. This was on Adam's post like last week and somebody commented something organically. A, I know Adam's not always great at getting back to his feed and B, there's just certain questions he's either not gonna answer. It was one of oh, these no. recent ones. <laughs> Okay, was... Sorry, bear with me two seconds. I should have had this up. I believe it was this one. Let's go take a look. A guy by the name of Shannon. There he is. So Shannon, okay. So Shannon comes in saying, hey, so um, Adam's post, just so you can get the whole kind of gist of this. Adam's post talked about the new self-liquidating offer that we just launched uh, February 21st. His post was $50 spent and made 500 on the front end. Not a bad start, right? Now, if I was a big enter, I could totally go running my mouth saying that I generated a 10x ROI and even start giving out advice. But instead, I know Facebook's try just trying to keep me spending money by rewarding quick wins. As soon as I start scaling, it'll likely be there very different, probably about a 1.5 to 2x ROI or break even. So instead, I'll just be quiet like many others should. So pretty good post. But this guy comes in to say, so I'm curious if you know any business models out there that help an entrepreneur without a current business start up and then get these kind of returns. I mean, starting from scratch, totally been thinking about wanting to have an online business. Um, but the done for you options like Amazon stores seem to be good too good to be true what they claim. Um, I just reply, hey, Shannon, I got a couple solid um, op 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 options or recommendations if you're starting from scratch i'm ready cool man i sent you a dm if you can't can't see it click it here you guys have all probably heard me talk about creating your own m.me links if you're using facebook outreach you should have these and anytime you dm somebody you should be including this link in the last kind of um comment in your thread here on facebook because if they don't accept your friend request and that message goes to the spam folder we all know people barely ever see those or see those two three four weeks later i'm guilty as charged i don't check my spam folder on facebook um very often myself but if they just click that it takes them right into your and their dm thread so everybody can create that for themselves very simple um so that i mean that that was again the transitional messaging this guy talked about his problem or what he's looking for a startup from scratch um and he talked a little about what he's thinking about trying and his apprehension there, right? Sounds too good to be true from what they claim. We all know those Amazon FBA and those drop shippings, uh, they, everything, right? In the beginning sounds so good. And we all learn that the affiliate or the MLM or the e-com or the drop shipping business isn't quite as easy as it sounded in the ad we saw or that BSL, right? Um, so, but again, very simple. I have a couple options. This guy could come. So that's a strong acceptance. I'm ready, right? I'm ready to take action. Boom. I'll just go right in for the booking there. Take it to a conversation. So let's go see what that conversation looked like when I took it into the DM real quick. Shannon, 
we actually good, had a good chat and I have a follow-up with him next week. I gave him two different offers and then sent him some resources, go figure, as I, I practice what I preach. So where'd the conversation just start? February, February 29th. So this would be the most recent one. So this guy, and I found this out, I didn't remember this, but he was already in my pipeline. You can see we spoke last year in June. So it had been quite a while. Um, and then I just reached out, hey, Shannon, just replying to your comment. Um, on Adam's post, right? Um, you mentioned looking for an online business opportunity starting from scratch. Basically, that's correct. Um, he gives me a thumbs up. Cool. So yeah, there's currently two or three pretty excellent opportunities. I can recommend maybe having a brief, brief 15 minute chat sometime soon so I can have a better understanding of what you're looking for. So I really know which option would be best recommendation. Sure. Phone call. Yeah, man. Phone works fine for me. I'll always do a phone for a first call. I'm not really getting into screen share or, or looking for a hard sale until I get to an actual sales call. I consider this a triage call. So I'm always happy to do those on the phone. Um, and especially if the, the prospect requests and asks for it, um, who am I to say no, right? So cool. I could do either uh, 11 a.m. or 12 p.m. Um, which one works for you? Monday is better. Cool. Monday, I have 11 or 2 p.m. 2 p.m. I'll book it in right now. What's the best number to reach you at? Boom, there's a number. Cool, Shannon, I'll ring you on 3-4 at 2 p.m. Enjoy your weekend. And then I always do this about a half hour before. Hey, Shannon, giving you a ring here in 30 minutes, check mark. Then after the conversation, he wanted to know more about our sales lab new offer. And this is the one he was most intrigued about, about the options I presented. He wanted some more information. Uh, we have a follow-up March 21st, 2020th. I have to look on my calendar. Next week, though, we have a follow-up where he's either going to make a purchase or he might want to look at one of the other options I recommended. Um, but there's just another good example of very simple, basic conversation, how I went on somebody else's post. Yes, in this case, it was a business partner. I totally get it. But Adam isn't looking for people right now, and he's not talking with people looking for startup opportunities from scratch. Now, in one of my new offers and one I am managing a sales team for, we have a couple of great biz op opportunities starting from scratch. So I was a lot better person to reach out and answer that question. Um, another one I want to go show you guys in terms of like utilizing other people's content. And probably I only shared this in the past with maybe people in my private PDOX client acquisition method program. Um, should be right down here, not too far. This one was really, really cool for anybody who hasn't seen it um, in terms of like my sniper approach and going and using other people's content. So I'll show you the exact strategy. And I do that in one of three ways. I, I look for other organic influencers or, you know, category kings, for lack of a better phrase, that serve a similar market as me, um, that post a lot of content and get a lot of engagement and don't always get back to their comments. We see that quite often. I look for competitor ads or any, not even always competitors, but people with their ads targeting a very similar audience to me. Um, and then third, um, I will use other people's, you know, posts within or other people's groups as we've talked about. So that one's that one's the more common. Um, okay, here it is. This is the post right here. So let me blow this up. So basically I said on here, hey guys, there's something fresh that I did and I shared with my team of centers inside my DM Center Academy that I thought you all would like. But a quick little eight step um, process and I'll show you each step in an image to getting leads without even posting any content. So number one, find a post or discussion find a post discussing a problem or a topic that you actually solve, right? That's a great start. Find comment of prospect dealing with said problem. Three through six, you'll see below. Use transitional messaging, as we just talked about, to send, get a friend request and a DM. Um, friend request sent by prospect in this case. Use DM to fill his gap and provide value. So let's just go through the images here real quick. So number one, Dan Henry's post. We both serve very similar audiences in a couple of different things. Um, one of his membership programs is similar to mine. He has sales offers very similar to some stuff we do or did in the past. And this is right up my alley. What sucks about generating online appointments? Great research question and a great question to do here if you're going to get good engagement to spin off into a conversation of substance, right? So very quickly, number one, found an influencer that talked about a problem that I solved. Right. So then number two, I'm looking for somebody that's suffering from this problem. And preferably the influencer or the poster here didn't reply, which he didn't. Um, if you see by the metric or by by the engagement here, sorry, it shows his comment was two days old by the time I engaged. Well, if Dan, the post person, didn't get back to him within two days, I'm not too worried about it. He probably never gonna, right? But what he what he said is finding dependable appointments. Um Center of dependable appointment setters that are actually performing. I've been through about 37 appointment setters in the last two to three months. Despite that, I have zero appointments to show for that. 
I'm not blaming all this on the appointment center, but despite me making several instructions, training videos, very few of them end up doing anything. Frustrating stuff. Another thing that sucks, reaching out to people in a way where they actually get and see your message can be hard. Social media and email, very unreliable. So I'm like, heard that, man. Hey, that's a good one I've solved recently. So I just kept it very basic there, right? Hey, that's a good problem that, that I recently solved. Uh, hold on a minute. This is in my way. When is Zoom going to ever move this toolbar? Just go, there we go. Um, he came back saying, nice. Any, any, um, what's he say? Any tips? Yes. Any tips? Sorry. It's a little burnt out. Sure. Shoot me a DM. I'd rather not blow up this thread with five or 10 comments back and forth. So I just went right into it. Found a post talking about a problem I solved, found somebody with a big, long explanation of what they've been through and talking a little about their pain and, and what they've experienced. And then a quick reply. I heard that my friend, you know, that's one I've solved. Nice. Any tips? Sure. You want to shoot me a DM, right? And then it goes on to say, thanks, I just DM'd you. So I like it when I can kind of lead a breadcrumb, breadcrumb trail with prospects and say, hey, man, yeah, I'd be happy to help you, but shoot me a friend request and a DM. I'm not always going to do the outreach. I'm going to put it on them when I can. The more that they will do and, and do outreach just shows that they are more likely to actually make a decision, implement, and, and likely more likely to become a buyer down the road. So thanks, I just DM'd you. Um, and then let's go to that conversation, right? So there's him in my DM, seven friend requests sent, boom. Um, just so you guys know, I'm not. And then basically, eight, here's the, once I've transitioned to DM, right? What am I going to offer a value? So, hey, Raymond, thanks for reaching out to me in the comment section. It'd be a blast to get to know your method and what you use to get some solid appointment centers for your company. Yeah, for sure. You're right. That is a tricky process and more so to do at scale. So I've been running an organic outreach and centers for years now. And that was one of our disconnects for clients, having their VA stay consistent, reliable, and hitting an exceeding KPI. I've gone hands-on with my um, with my organization refining said process over the last six months. I'd be happy to send over a brief video overview of the process and what we do to get better results or what we do better and different than what most are doing if you'd like, right? Uh, Oh, that was the last one I say. But he came back saying, yeah, send it over. I sent it over, booked him in for a call. Uh, he ended up buying one of my downsells, one of my entry-level products. Um, he just bought the overview into how to build out, hire, and, and build proper SOPs. He really realized after going through my training, going back to like his statement there about 37 setters and getting no results. And he even said it in there. He's like, I've created, you know, video trainings and this, but he didn't have a streamlined process. There was no clear tracking metrics. And, and a lot of his setters didn't really know. They knew what their daily activity requirements were. They didn't necessarily know how to go execute. And he saw the disconnect with setting up the resources and how hands-on you have to be with the training. And he came back saying, Ray, I wasn't doing all that stuff. Let me try to implement this. I've never heard back from him since, whether it's good or bad. I mean, he only bought like a $97 product. I'm guessing he got a pretty good result from it because usually if I don't hear back, that's a good thing. You usually only hear back when people are like, this didn't work, right? This sucked, right? Or what you said was like not helpful. Um, but there's a couple really good examples of things you can be doing. So, you know, back to the overarching ideology be behind the beginning of the call of don't overthink it, be publishing and consuming more than you're, than you're consuming. So I always say create more than you consume. If you're spending more time on social media, scrolling and looking at other people's stuff, you're probably not very effective with your lead gen or booking appointments or conversations. Um, and uh, just really don't overthink it. Just go out there and test. There's no bad posts. There's posts that don't work and you're going to learn really quickly. This didn't work. Let me change the topic. Sometimes it's just how we phrased it or the lead type, as you hear me talk about some of my other trainings. But um yeah, so I got through a lot here pretty quick, which was nice. Um, I think I covered a lot. Hopefully, I shared a lot of value on all the aspects I meant to cover. And uh, anybody on here, um, JP, Fahad, um, Miss Wingate, since I'm not sure of the first name, um, anybody have any feedback, comments, questions? I'd love to hear from anybody if you got a sec. Hi there. It's Rebecca, <laughs> by the way. Rebecca, now I remember. Um, yeah, that's okay. Uh, JP's wife. I knew, I knew that. I just forgot the first name. We'd yeah. spoken once before. That's okay. No, um, great call. Super awesome. Love, love all of the info. Everything you said makes absolute total sense. Um, very valuable call. Thank you very much. Sorry, thank the you. kids are going to go next. No, no, no. That's the biggest thing. I Thank you. That's the feedback. Like everything made sense. That's what I want to happen in these calls. I don't want to confuse people when I'm doing these. And sometimes I know I talk fast. Yeah, or... no, you simplified it really Perfect. great. Thank you. That's my that's my end goal, really. Great. Um, either of you two, JP or Fod, anything to add? Oh, I got a couple comments there. Perfect. Maybe you just said. Sorry, was muted. Super awesome, uh, Fahad. Super awesome. 
Um, I think hyper posting is also a way. No, you're right. That, that's a good point. Hyper posting is also a way to, to warm up and grow organically. Um, 100%. The only thing I would say with that is you still have to be very cognizant of the objective and the content you're creating when you're doing that. But I would fully agree. I think the one problem I see with either hyper posting or you know, um, just posting X amount of times a day because a coach told you is a lot of times people think they need to post something at say 9 a.m. noon and 3 p.m. because that's what their coach told them. Then they go three, create three posts or three different, you know, topics of content just to create content. It's not necessarily like from the creation point of, hey, this is going to provide value. Hey, I want to share this with my audience because I think it will really build me more trust. Like if you have a purpose behind that content, great. But if you're just posting to post because somebody thinks, you know, told you to, or you think you need to, I would say that's wrong. I would say less is more there because you got to think a lot of Facebook prospecting is going to be about your new connections. Those are who are more likely to engage, more likely to consume your trainings as people lurk around longer. Yeah. People convert later, no doubt, but your, your newer audience. So think about it from that perspective. If somebody just joined my timeline today and started scrolling back to my posts and I have three posts yesterday, three of the day before and three day, the day before, and two out of three each day are kind of worthless or or not very relevant content or not very engaging, somebody's going to look at your profile and they're going to scroll through six or eight posts all within the last day or two and say, this guy's kind of boring. That's why if you look at my timeline, you probably see four to five posts a week and probably a healthy mix of, hey, I'm running this event. Hey, we just got this uh, great result. Hey, here's me on a run with my, you know, out at the park. Hey, here's me out at an event with my daughter. So there's a healthy mix and I'm doing that for a reason. Um, I think Facebook is a platform where people want to connect as a person, as much as, you know, your, your level of expertise or, um, you know, your sophistication level and the problem you can solve for people. So I think there's a really good healthy mix. And sometimes people get lost in that when they just post to post rather than with an actual objective of why they're posting or having a strategy. When I first started online, that was what my first business coach told me, right? You got to post a minimum of three posts per day on your timeline. Also be active. I was just talking about my timeline there. Yes, you should be posting in groups actively. That's totally different. But just for my own timeline, through trial and error, I started to figure out this isn't really working. And when I started to pull some of my newer friends or people on my timeline, they'd be like, hey, man, I just don't know. Like I scrolled through six or eight of your posts. They were there was nothing great there. And I started to think more and more about it. And then I started to scroll back through my posts. I was like, I don't even think these are good. Like, why am I doing this? Right. And sometimes we got a question, you know, we're just doing things because we're told. And it's great to follow what you, you know, follow um, a coach or a program or a structure. But you're going to follow that for one of two reasons to prove that, it, hey, I put in the work and this works or, hey, I put in the work and this approach actually isn't working for me. So I need to tweak it or go to a different approach. So if you have that objective, either one, neither one is a fail. You learn something either way. Um, if it works, great. If it doesn't, you know, you need to tweak it. So, um, yeah, that's what I would say on that. But but you're, you're so right. Um, how active you are. And the other thing that can really help you on social media is how much you engage with the people that you want engaging with you. So when you have new people join your timeline, go start to like and comment and see their, their stuff. And then your content is going to go in front of them more. So that's another thing people don't really do anymore, especially people with like a higher maybe status, right? That have more of a business sense and they're adding kind of entry level people into their pipeline, they don't really go back and engage with those people's content. And that also hurts your reach and, and, and your impressions and how many people are going to see your stuff. So yeah, a couple other tips there, but that was a great point, Fahd. I'm glad I got to speak to that a little. Just real quickly, I did want to um, say that we do practice quality over quantity as well, because like you were saying, if someone goes back and scrolls through, and half of your posts are nonsense and they're not really anything of value, people aren't going to stick around because half the time you're just, you know, playing around. You're not really actually giving any value or actual input for people to use. So they're just not going to stick around long term. Couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more. 100 percent. Yep. Nailed it there. I would also add a point that if you have evergreen content, uh, you don't need to find new posts, you know, and you can repost your evergreen content again and again. 100%. Actually, before you guys hopped on, I covered that at the top of the call on one of the quick little worksheets I went through, but I fully agree. I talk about repurposing or evolving your content, right? So you might have evergreen content um, that you're also going to evolve and tweak a little because what you know now, as opposed to last year when you created that, your thought process might have changed your strategy, your approach. So it's great to repurpose content that's still relevant or evolve the content that had engaged in the past and now you look at it a little differently. Um, and another thing I would say, Rebecca, to speak on, on your point is another thing I get asked about organic is like, 
should I take a stand on topics or am I going to ostracize my audience? What I've learned more and more is at first, I, I tried to really stay away from talking about any of my like political beliefs, moral beliefs. And as I've got more and more in this space, I, I learned it's the exact opposite, what I feel works for me, at least. I would prefer to just be my authentic self and resonate with the people that also have similar beliefs, values, morals, ethics, that kind of stuff. Um, a lot of times we are maybe ostracizing or alienating a certain part of the community that would never be our ideal client we wouldn't want anyway so for me that's a win i think your content and and your messaging should speak to your ideal person or the people you want you know on your timeline to engage with you to ultimately maybe become a client and it should also kind of push away your not ideal audience so that's just kind of my thought process and something i've learned over the years and what's worked for me uh don't know if anybody has any thoughts on that yeah, we generally do try to stay away from things like politics and, you know, anything that's not polite, um, civilized, sorry, polite, civilized yeah. conversation. You yeah, know, yeah. anything that's maybe not politically things. correct, per se. Yeah, politically correct. There you go. Yep. Sorry, and I did that forever. Like I did that forever. I started to get more, and I still don't do it much. I have a private little group that barely anybody is in, just really close family and friends where I share that kind of stuff. Um, there's a lot of it I wouldn't share, but I've got I've got a little more to being as authentic as possible. I mean, one of my one of my core values and something anybody that knows me really knows about me is I'm unfiltered. Like I say what I speak. So I started to realize like I'm not being totally authentic when I'm censoring myself. There's certain things I, I won't touch and, and I'll save for a little private group, but I've got I've got more to to not being um, what's the word I'm looking maybe afraid I don't know if that's the right word but you know fear of of alienating people or saying their own thing like I've gotten over that more and more and I realized the more you do take a stand on that the more you actually build brand loyalty and that's just again me could be different for everybody and depending on how professional or the business you're in there's certainly times I would never get political if I'm a part of certain organizations so that's just how I look at it but it's a great point and on both ends of the spectrum and it's I think it's a good conversation to have JP, you had something? You're not unmuted, honey. He's unmuted, but I can't hear him. I oh, now, now. There you go. Again. Perfect. Well, um, before I make my comment um, on the topic, just wanted to thank you once again, Mr. Remy, for having an amazing uh, weekly call that we can tap into and connect with you and your team and the remainder of the company. So an amazing opportunity for us uh, to uh, connect in that way. Um, very briefly here, two things. Um, it's super windy outside, so if my mic gets windy, just let me know. No, you're good. Um, we, talk a, we talk a lot about strategic or targeted communication in a way that either repels your target or it attracts your target. And so, for example, like dual purpose communication, it's like you're trying to pull in a very specific market and yep. push out another type of market. Now, divisive marketing is for masters only. So I, I, I don't want to say that and have somebody go out there and say some crazy divisive stuff and like, oh my You're gosh, I up a bit, the entire network. I don't want to promote that. But what I'm saying, okay, thank you. No, uh, I but what I'm saying is that, um, okay, awesome. Uh, the more masterful or sophisticated marketer understands the nuances of communication and language and specifically vocabulary, right? So certain even keywords, trigger words, buzzwords, et cetera, that we use in the marketing world um, we have to understand that just because we say something doesn't mean that the intended audience is going to see and interpret that word and that linguistic uh, code the same way that we do. So like trigger words are very, very volatile, right? Yeah. And they're volatile for a reason. We can say one trigger word, and I, I, I take this back to my career 20 plus years ago, I was doing a pitch and I said one wrong word and the client got up and said, um, you know, love you, you're awesome, can't work with you, have a great day. And it wasn't personal. I used one wrong word, one. So that's, that's how specific this can. Be. So, so to your point, yes, it is a fearful moment because if you miscommunicate and and or opposite the conversation, misunderstand, now there's a disconnect, there's a schism, and now we have conflict. And this is where conflict is generated, right? This is where linguistics professors talk about this. So what we want to do at the same time is yes, we want to attract, but we also want to push out, say, for example, um, potential problem clients or potential problem people in our lives. Because one of the things that um, we as marketers oftentimes do is we will take all comers, anybody that knocks on the door, oh yeah, I'll take a new client. Oh yeah, I'll take another client yeah. and another client. Next thing you know, you have a roster of clients that either are disconnected in vision 
disconnected in focus, disconnected in value systems and or belief structures. And then on top of that, everybody is coming from this, from a completely disjointed perspective. It's really hard to get organized around that. And that's why a lot of agencies kind of stall out, quite frankly, is because they're sending out 500 marketing messages to 500 different industry niche verticals and they're not getting any traction because they're not able to generate the amount of interest that they need to get critical mass in that one vertical to reach scale, right? So horizontally speaking, they're, they're, they're shooting their, 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 their energy at the lowest possible outcome as opposed to saying, okay, how do I structure my messaging for highest impact, highest outcome, highest return on investment, highest return on time, highest return on capital, et cetera, et cetera. And that comes down to content creation, content management systems, and then how do you publish that like you're talking about? So anyhow, wonderful, juicy topic. We can talk about this all day. Yeah. I'm sure we all can. Uh, just want to uh, add to the call. And thank you once again, Raymond. Talk to you no, soon. Thank you for that addition. Care. I mean, very, very well said. I couldn't agree with everything you said there more, especially, you know, you, you kind of went in a little more detail, which was great. But what you started off about saying about uh, divisive marketing is for masters. Um, you know, be careful how you use it. I don't want to, like you said, that could be a long discussion, right? If we start getting into when and who should use it, that, that would go on for 30 minutes or more easily, especially with you and I, JP. Um, but great points. Well, the, and the, last, the, the last three presidents have used that. The last three presidents have used that and the next president will use it again. Oh, sure. and the next president after that will use it again, right? So it's, it's an apolitical issue. That's the thing I love about talking to you, Raymond, is that these topics and these issues, they're apolitical, right? Everybody can come to the table and say, let's contribute and let's have these, these discussions. So thank you once again for holding the space and we appreciate you. We'll see you next week. Yeah, awesome. Thanks for hopping on, guys. I got to run to my 245. I'm running a minute late for already. I got to go manage another sales team call, but um, we'll, we'll all get together soon. Thank you, guys.